later. I love those being on YouTube. That just makes me laugh. All right, here we go. Let's see what happens. Share screen. Okay, let's Brand. unmute. So Brand. you don't accidentally cough over. I got it. Hey, so far so good. Okay, the Yangtze Patrol, another view. Why the Yangtze Patrol? Because I spent time along the Yangtze in one of my careers. Um, I sort of got shanghai to use the term, into building a Chinese boiler with a Chinese crew, with a Chinese consultant in bu the bucolic suburbs of Wuhan, China. And this was back when, every, when you said you were going to Wuhan and everybody said, what's a Wuhan? Now we know what a Wuhan is. It was an experience. And when I was, first time I worked overseas, first time I worked in that metric system, and the first time I worked with a crew of people that you couldn't talk to because you couldn't speak the same language. So I have, as I, after that experience, I found a couple of covers that were attached, that were postmarked in Wuhan and off I went on this little tangent. So let's go. So here we have the Yangtze River um, flowing from Shanghai all the way up through the Three Gorges up to Chongqing. Now you notice that Chongqing, we used to spell that Chongqing differently. Um, when the communists took over China, they changed the pinyin, which is the Latin alphabet, and some of these, so some of these names have changed. Um, we can see good old Wuhan down there and the Three Gorges Dam. Now the Yangtze is China's longest river. It's long, longest river in Asia. It's the sixth largest by volume. It drains about 20% of China's land mass. And when you look at the river, you say swear that the 20% is floating down the river. Um, it's home to a third of the population and is navigable up to uh, Chongqing by ocean vessels. Third, so we've got the Yangtze Patrol, which consisted of a uh, variety of vessels. They were war prizes for the Spanish-American War. They were U.S. purchased, U.S. built. They were taken apart and shipped over to China and reassembled. They were U.S. designed and Chinese built. We cooperated with the other foreign powers in China. And the Yangtze Patrol was tasked with protecting U.S. property and U.S. citizens. And here we see one where they were protecting U.S. property, the Texaco people. Now, Texaco oil really isn't oil as in petroleum products like we'd use in the, to make gasoline. This was actually tongue oil, which is a, dry, a drying compound that you had to paint. But here's the Patriot at the Texaco docks. Um, Texaco also loaned the Navy a firing range to practice um, marksmanship. Now, the Yankee Patrol, sh the ships, well, they were small ships. They went through multiple decommissionings, multiple recommissionings. Two saw service under at least two flags, and one of them had the distinction of being scuttled twice. So here's a comparison. We've got the USS Houston, an auxiliary uh, cruiser, and next to it, we have got a Yankee Patrol boat. And you can see there's a heck of a difference in size. So the ships, well, they, they were Spanish ships that were taken from the Spanish during the Spanish-American War and converted to US Navy service. They were designed, US ships that were designed with low draft. Initially, we built them in the um, US, US yards, particularly in California. We disassembled them, shipped them to China and rebuilt them. The Navy switched the Chinese built ships in a Chinese dockyard, the King Yan dockyard, which is still in existence today. But they were built with American armament and American made motor power that we shipped to China. They were supported by a shore based infrastructure. Let's talk about the Spanish ships. First, we had the Quiros. I think I'm pronouncing that properly, but I don't speak Spanish. It was built in Hong Kong by the Spaniards. It was sold into the US in 1900 after the Spanish American War because they concluded that they'd never be able to get the thing back to Spain. We re recommissioned it as a US ship in 1900. And it got sunk in 1923 in a gunnery exercise. We had the Villa Lobos, which was captured in 1898. It was commissioned in 1900, also went down in a gunnery exercise. We've got the Elcano. We captured it from Spain in the, Spain in the Philippines. It was commissioned in 1902 and sunk in Tarkin practice. The Elcano, by the way, is named after the actual Spanish commander that was the first guy to circumnavigate the world. The, Magellan gets the credit, but Magellan got killed in a, in a battle in the Philippines. 
We've got the Kalo, it was also a war prize. And we've got the General Alva, which was a receiving ship for the Yangtze Patrol for several years. Now, all these ships took play, part in the uh, Philippine-American War. After we took the Philippines, there was a war between the U.S., basically a war between the U.S. and various insurgent forces in the Philippines. Um, the U.S. won that war. I think one of the, as I recall, one of the legacies of that war is the Colt 45, because we were having problems with the uh, caliber of the and the caliber of the sidearms that we were using in terms of stopping the insurgents. So we developed the Colt 45. Uh, so here's one of the Spanish ships, the General Alva. And what does it look like? This is what it looks like. I mean, you can see we've got a gun on the front. We've got probably got a couple of guns on the back. Hardly an imposing warship. We've got the Quirrell. Now here we've got a note from one of the sailors that his address has been changed from the Cincinnati to the Quirrell's on the Asiatic Station, courtesy of the US Postal Service. We maintain, by the way, a postal service in China. So here's a picture of the Quiros, another yacht-like looking ship. Although if you look at the smoke coming out of this thing, either he had the cameras where either he was lit from the back or he was doing a heck of a poor job at combustion. So we've got some US designed ships, the Isabel, the Pan A, the Tutila, the Palos, Mindanao, Luzon, Oahu, and the Wake and Guam. So let's take a look at them. The Isabel was a private yacht that was built for John Wiley's. Wiley's was a U.S. automobile manufacturer. He built this yacht and he built it to sort of naval standards prior to the start of the First World War. And he sold it to the Navy as a destroyer escort, as a destroyer and a convoy escort during the war. After the war, they realized that, you know, when you look at this, this really isn't the destroyer in the, in the true sense of the word. So they called it a patrol yacht. They sent it up and up and down the Mississippi as a recruitment aid. And I guess, guess they figured they woo the, they wow the locals that this is the kind of ship you were going to be on if you just signed up in the Navy. But it also became the only Navy ship that served on the Mississippi and on the Yangtze. And it was the flagship of the Yangtze Patrol for seven years from 1921 on. It moved from the Philippines to Australia during the opening phase of the Pacific War. And actually, it was the only ship that survived in US service throughout World War II. It was decommissioned in 1945 because I think basically they fi couldn't figure out quite what to do with the thing. So here we have a cover from the Isabel. We've got a picture of it and it does indeed look like a yacht. And again, is they're firing coal, but they're not doing a good job of it. So we have the Pan A. The Pan A was kind of a intriguing ship. It was built in Shanghai at the Kiang Bach and Engineering Company in 1927, where we sent over the design, they built it, we sent over the engineering stuff, the boilers, engineering machinery and the armaments. It was sunk on the Japanese, by the Japanese Army aircraft in 1937. It was assigned to um, support US Embassy personnel in Nanking, which was one of the wartime capitals of China after Beijing, Peking, now Beijing fell. Um, the ship actually had a huge U.S. flag planted on, painted on the top of it, and there was no question that this was a U.S. vessel. But the Japs, Japanese apologized. They paid two million bucks in 1937 dollars for the loss of the ship, and they were apparently very sorry about it. There is a story around that Roosevelt schmoozed the uh, press because there were several members of the press on board to kind of modify the story, shall we say, so that we didn't infuriate the American public and get us into a shooting war with Japan in 1937. This is a Pan A cover stamped in Hankow. Um, here's the Pan A when it was afloat, and we can see we've got a gun on the back. There's a classic picture of, the, of this ship in action during the uh, attack on in Tolly's boat on the Yangtze patrol. And here's what's left of her after the attack. She settled down in relatively shallow water. They scrapped the amount of scrapping the vessel. They decided it was really wasn't worth trying to salvage. So now we've got the Tutila. It was built in Shanghai, the Kayang docks, with the last US gunboat on the Yangtze. It got trapped up in Chongqing, and this is the uh, this is the old spelling of it by the attack on Pearl Harbor. We turned it over to the Japanese or to the Chinese under lead lease, and they called it the Mian. The crew returned to the States, and it was shuttled, scuttled in Shanghai. 
head of the communist advance in World War, post World War II Chinese Civil War. Here we have a cover. I think this this the seal is another add-on. Here we have the tutila, and again, this we can see this is a uh, rather small vessel. You notice a lot of cases we've got a awnings. We do awnings over the deck, and I think that that's because areas along the Yangtze are really are really hot. Wuhan, for example, was considered what's called one of the ten furnace cities in China, and in the summer it definitely lived it lived up to its reputation. So I think they put yawnings over the decks, and the crew tried to sleep up there to get some some degree of comfort in the evening, rather than being sleeping below deck, because these ships basically weren't air conditioned. So the, we have the palace as another one. We built it in the U.S. in 1912. I think we built it in Merritt Island shipyards. We cut it into sections. We shipped it as cargo. We rebuilt it in Shanghai and commissioned it in 1914. It was able to go way up the river, well beyond Chongqing, due to its very low draft. And it was used for periodic, periodic missionary rescues on the Yangtze tributaries. It served as a, cha as a station ship, and it got scuttled in 1939 before the war. Missionaries were a problem throughout the this period because they were located out there in the boonies. Um, they were very vulnerable. Uh, you were, they, while they were foreigners, there was, there was a lot of, there was a lot of concern because they were clashing with the local, local law uh, cultures. And so they, so they re periodically required some degree of rescue or support. So here we've got the cover from the Palos at, Stamped up in Chiang, up in Chongqing back in 1935. At this point, I think we were they were at war with the Japanese. Here is the palace again. We see the deck, the deck coverings. Now we've got the Mindanao. It was built in Shanghai at the Qingyan docks. It became the flagship for the South China Patrol in 1929. It left it, it pulled out of China before for the Philippines before the Pearl Harbor attack there was because these things were built for liver for river work and there was kind of hell of a lot of doubt as their ability to get across an open ocean but it actually made it they participated in the defense of the Philippines they scuttled it in my in Manila Bay in 1942 prior just prior to the fall of Corregidor so here we have the cover with the South China Patrol logo back in 1932, 10 years before its demise. The eyes in the, and here we have another, again, we have the awnings to try to keep the crew comfortable. Two stacker, probably undoubtedly coal fired. We now have the, the other ship, another ship was the Guam. It was a gunboat with multiple names and nationalities. It was built in Shanghai in 1927, according to US drawings with US engineering equipment and U.S. Uh, weaponry. It was need, renamed the Wake to allow the Guam to be used. As I understand from some reading, there was a superstition in the Navy that if it was extremely bad luck to rename a ship once it had been christened, these guys had bad luck. It was renamed the Tatera after the Japanese captured in Shanghai in, the day after Pearl Harbor. We retook it at the end of the war. We gave it to the Chinese nationalists. They renamed it the Mai Wan. They renamed it. It was captured by the communists in Shanghai. They renamed it. They reflagged it, and it disappeared into the mists. So here we see the Guam in Hank, good in Hank, good old Hankow in February 1941, before our, before our involvement in the war. Here is the wake. Or the Guam now is the wake with its first day of naval service. I think this the dragon is a add-on. I don't think this was a, a true um, part of the camera. So here we see the wake under the Japanese flag after December 8th, 1941. They've still got the awnings on the deck. They're still patrolling the river. We have the Luzon that was built again in the Kayang dockyard. It was the flagship for the Yangtze patrol for 10 years. We scuttled in Manila Bay in 1942. The Japanese refloated this thing in 1942 and they renamed it to Karatsu. Karatsu, I, I don't speak Japanese either. We torpedoed it in 1944. We didn't sink it, we just, we damaged it badly. It got sent for, to Manila for repairs. Um, 
Of course, we, we invaded uh, the Philippines in 1944. The Japanese hadn't quite replaced, repaired it. So it got scuttled by the Japanese in Manila Bay in 1945. So this ship, it was, has the dubious distinction of being the old, of being one of the few that got scuttled and resurrected, or got resurrected and rescuttled. So here we see the cover again in Hankow. Prior to the war, um, we have the picture of the Luzon, lifeboats, double deckers. We have the Oahu named after the islands in the uh, Hawaii. Hawaii, they were built in, of course, in, again, in the Gona Kiang dockyard. It was a station ship at Ai Chang, Chungking, and elsewhere. It served as a relo, re, radio relay for the US Embassy when it was at Nanking. After, eventually, Nanking falls to the Japanese, and our embassy gets pulled back into Chungking. It was sunk by Japanese gunfire in 1942 during the uh, defense of the Philippines. Here's the Wa here's a Oahu cover back in, up in Chongqing, actually, in China, um, back in 1933, well before the start of the war. Here we see a picture of it with our gun on the deck, the uh, double stacks. Now, as part of this, you had some shore based support. Now, we had this the internet, Shanghai was actually an international settlement. We had we maintained forces there. The British maintained forces, French maintained forces. It was considered at the time probably the most corrupt city in the world. There is some indication that the French ran the opium cons opium concessions. The they had the um, Japanese secret police whacking Jap opponents of Japanese rule. We had the Japanese. We had the Chinese Tongs, which were basically a, you can think of as basically a mafia type organization whacking each other and pro-Japanese pro people. We had the um, nationalist secret police. We had the Chinese communist groups. It was a wild and it was truly a wild area. We maintained a purchasing office in Shanghai. We also incidentally, as, a, as an aside, collecting aside, we have a set of stamps. We have actually two sets of stamps. Um, they were actually put overprinted in China. One was done when apparently the uh, local po our postmaster over there and some of his buddies got together on the banks of the Pearl River, consumed a considerable number of adult beverages and decided that, hey, everybody else has got overprints. Why can't we have overprints? So they took every stamp they had and they overprinted it, Shanghai, China. Now the word finally got back to the US Post Office and like most formal organizations, they didn't have a real good sense of humor. And our postmaster got a nasty little letter telling him that, hey, knock this off. You know, if we want overprints, we'll make them. Eventually, we actually, we did make a set of overprints that were used in, used for mail from, basically from Shanghai over to the US. Another supporting organization, of course, was the dockyard that we mentioned. There were local firms that sold goods and services to the Navy. There were local nationals that worked aboard the gunboats. And as I understand it, some of these guys actually made, as a deckhand on a US gunboat, actually made more money than a colonel in the uh, nationalist army. But, and they had the other ad advantage that they actually got paid, which is was kind of unique in the uh, area. So here's their support. We have the dockyards that we've mentioned. The dockyard, Kingsian dockyard and dock and engineering works. These guys have did a number of ships. Actually, they built a number of ships for us and for foreigners. And as I mentioned, they're still in existence. Here they're building the Tutila. We've got a couple of the con contractors on board. We can see the uh, area for the props and the rudders. Here is a, here is a nice little pit, picture of the dockyards. We can see all the, we can see the boilers. If you <clears throat> watch the Titanic, these, these boilers, these type of boilers, uh, were featured in the best um, scene in the movie in the engine room. They were coal fired. They were all riveted together. And let's see what are we, here we've got their dry dock for a much much larger ship. And we have one of our guys sitting here watching carefully watching the dry, the dry dock. We had the four. We mentioned we had the fourth Mar U.S. Marines in Shanghai, and here are a group of them wandering through the city. Um, 
when I think I've never been in a Marine, but when I think about the Marines, somehow I don't picture them drinking Coca-Cola when there's ice cold beer available. These guys eventually, as I, rec- I think these guys eventually got pulled out and they got routed back to the Philippines prior to the outbreak of war. Um, and here we have their a cover from the Marines in 1939. The war is already going on between China and Japan. They are um, we aren't involved. We are only peripherally involved in terms of rescuing American citizens and trying to stay out of the way. Here we have another one. Good old T. Tom the tailor in Shifu, China. If you need your uniform or your clothier or general outfitter, he was the man to see. Now, there's actually a T. Tom tailor down in San Antonio, Texas. And I've never been able to find out if this, these guys, if they are related to these guys or not. But here's clearly a case where the locals are making money supporting the foreigners in China. And we have a Navy purchasing office in China. We maintain an office there to buy supplies, uh, consumables, various other things. I don't know how they how they manage. I know when we were over there and dealing doing business with the Chinese there was a basic cultural collapse, clash. You know, when you do business in the US, you'd like to have progress payments. You'd like to feel that, see something tangible, a release of drawings and purchase of materials, some things you can tangibly say, yes, we'll send you some more money. When you did, we did business with the Chinese, we discovered that they had a totally different attitude. They operated on the theory that you were gonna stiff them. Not for any reason, not that they didn't finish or not that they didn't do it right, but you just chose not to pay them. So they wanted to get all the money, as much money as they could up front. So when you walked away way on them, at least they had some money. It was an interesting experience. That was an interesting experience. So here we had a we had personnel transfers. Whoops. So here we got a sailor on the Maryland in 1909 who's telling his young lady that he's going out to China. And if they're in there, there's his spelling. If there's anything you want from there, let me know and I'll get it for you. Apparently, he was rather happy to go out to China. We were, you know, we were, we weren't that quite that happy. Um, but this is an interesting little twist on personnel transfers out there. He would have gone to Shanghai, he would have been on the station ship, and then he would have been reassigned to one of the ships out there. Now, there's there's some background information on the. Uh, the Yangtze Patrol. Uh, there's several books on the era, era that are available. The Yangtze Patrol by Kim Polly is probably the best, is probably the classic on it. There are a couple of other ones that deal with the actual era. era. Uh, one of them is the Dowager, Dowager Empress CC by Young Chang. Um, CC was the last, basically the last empress of China. If you saw the uh, classic 89 days in Peking where Charlton Heston and David Niven take on all of China. She was in there. Uh, she made a major effort to try to modernize China. It's, it's an interesting read of the, of the era in which the Yangtze patrol and uh, foreign involvement in China was and the challenges the Chinese um, faced in trying to modernize. Another book is Big Sister, Little Sister, Red Sister by Young Chang. These were three, actually three sisters. The big sister married Chiang Kai-shek's, these are the Sung sisters, actually. Big sister married Chiang Kai-shek's finance minister. And mysteriously, she became the richest woman in China, probably because she was filching our aid. Little sister married Chiang Kai-shek. She moved with him and big sister and the finance minister to Taiwan after the... uh, Communists won the Civil War. Red Sister was Miles, one of Mao's left-hand ladies. She supported Mao. The, she would have made a heck of an interesting gathering, family gathering. They never got together. Uh, Red Sister died in Communist China. The government offered to let the other two sisters come back and take part in the uh, funerals, but they declined. So other backgrounds as well, there's the Three Kingdoms. Three Kingdoms is one of the, if you do business in China, or if you do business with the Chinese, it's well worth reading. It's one of the Chinese classics. It deals with the collapse of one of the dynasties. 
the Ming Dynasty. And there are three factions that are uh, vying for power. When I was over there, this was on, this was one of the TV movies that you could see on Chinese TV. Of course, it was all in Chinese, so you couldn't figure out what the heck was going on, other than the fact that eventually somebody got his head whacked off and you had to say, I guess this guy made a suboptimal uh, choice in sides. It's, the copy I've got is in English. It's three volumes, two and a half for the book. One and a half of them is an explanation of what you're reading so you understand it. It's considered about 70% um, historically accurate. Another one is the movie, The Sand Pebbles, which is based, allegedly based on either Mindanao or the Villa Lobos. Um, it's kind of accurate, I think, in terms of the time and what was going on post-World War I, but there was never a USS San Pablo. Another movie that we don't mention, of course, is the one I just said, The 89 Days at, Bay, at Peking, which dealt with the Boxer Rebellion and the outcome of it. So we, that's it. We got any questions, comments, thoughts? Is anybody awake? Yes. <laughs> Well, that was that was excellent. It's too bad we didn't have more people uh, hearing that because I've always been kind of curious about the Yangtze Patrol. I knew virtually nothing about it, but it, but the, you know it keeps coming up in in discussion. So uh, that's a great backgrounder. You know, one of the interesting things about this was when you went into the Wuhan Museum, there was a display. They had number they had, they had a dis basic historic display, but they also had one that showed what looked, looked like World War II atrocities, followed by a set of posters on the uh, PLA, the Chinese the Communist Army, and it was sort of unsaid, but it was sort of a message that, hey, folks, this is what it was before, but now we're here and nobody's messing with us. It was an interesting propaganda piece. <laughs> so I guess sort of a general question, uh, Nora, is. Um, you know, I, I get it. There were a lot of American interests in China um, and uh, a lot of things going on there. Uh, Shanghai being the international city or whatever it was. But, you know, why why uh, did China sort of allow the U.S. to have its patrol there as opposed to, let's say, a patrol on the Amazon or some other river? Why, or the Mekong, for example, down in Southeast Asia? Why the Yang? The Mekong, why? well, let's, let's say this. The Mekong was, French, was in French Indus, China, so the French okay, were, yeah, right. were patrolling that. Right. Um, why did they do this? Because it goes back to, a, they had a basic problem. There was a, how do we say this? There was, a, there was an individual back in the 1700s who, in the time of the dynasty, you took, um, an exam to become an official. And if you pass the exam, you would move up in the Mandarin ranks and become an official. You could take it several times. And if you flunked it, well, you were one of the peasants. The fact is that China, my, my son spent time over there. He told me there was a, there was an express, a Chinese, it's still a Chinese expression. It basically was tie your pigtail to the rafters and put a beam in your back so that you can keep on studying. Well, this particular individual didn't make it, but he was, influenced by the missionaries. And he came up and he decided that the Christian Bible, which of course says that Christ is the son of God, had a little chapter missing. God actually had a Chinese son, who as it turned out was him. The emperor of course, being the son of heaven, thought he had claim to that and the Chinese got into a hell of a civil war. I mean, the, the, the body count of the civil war make makes the U.S. Civil War look like a basically like a minor skirmish. He came very close to overthrowing the actual the Chinese dynasty. The Chinese hired a group of European generals, because in those days, if your army wasn't fighting, you could rent a general. Yeah, you could keep our guys in practice, you know. And so they went over there. They eventually defeated this guy, the, the, the boy that thought he was the... Uh, son of God. But they learned something very important. And what they learned was that, you know, actually the Chinese were pretty weak. They were very vulnerable. They didn't have a, there are, there, they didn't have a great army. They didn't have great tactics. They were open. And so the company, the people started, the, the foreigners started moving in. 
earlier than that, the uh, British moved in and they they were running they were they were actually running dope into China. They were running yeah. they were running opium into China. The interesting thing is, by the way, when you went in, I went into the Hong Kong Museum over there when it, when it was still British, and it was a kind of an interesting display because they had a section that showed the um, native peoples of Hong Kong. And then bang, it was a British colony. And they left out the uh, part about running opium in there in the opium war. So the British went in there, they, they easily defeated the Chinese. And that basically let it wide open. Everybody and his brother decided that, you know, here's a heck of a great market. We can go in there, we can take market share, we can establish bases. And they started moving in and chopping up the country. Now, the U.S. actually, we held back. We didn't have any firm basis per se, but we had general, a general agreement that said that whatever you guys get, we get. So if they had extraterritorial rights, for example, you would be tried in a foreign court if you committed a crime rather than in a Chinese court, we maintained that. So there, there were basic um, industry on the, on the river and on the Yangtze, there was trade, and so these people, they felt that you needed to have uh, people patrolling it. There. Yep. So you went on to good old gunboat diplomacy, and this was truly yep. gunboat diplomacy. Right. But this, this still has a legacy today when the Chinese refer to the unequal treaties. So this, this, this legacy has carried on. Right on. Excellent. Wow, that's great. Uh, that's a lot of history in a... In a, in a crazy form so thank you that's excellent it's, it's it's an interesting place it was an interesting place to be it was an interesting it's an interesting area anybody else i just want to say Norma, that was really fascinating you did a great job with this china was an interesting experience i would i'm glad i did it but i sure as hell would not go back oh you're going to do another one in the future we know that well, I'll do another one of these, but I wouldn't go back to China. I don't know oh, oh, oh. Uh, for any of you who are interested, by the way, in um, in the Chinese stuff, I actually have a Navy go down, which you is one do? of the naval warehouses from the Yangtze River. That's yeah. going to be coming up in, um, gosh, I think we're up to April's special auction ah. next year. So if you're ah. looking, I have to put these things together far in advance because they have to go to the print, yeah. To, to Richard and stuff. But yeah, if you're interested in that sort of thing, there is going to be a go down. I had never seen one before. I actually had to look up what it was because it puzzled me completely. Uh, but if you're interested in that sort of thing. I have, yeah. a, I have an article on those covers from the Hankow go down in I think 2003 in the log. Yeah. Um, it's a Honeyman Award winner, so you can find it in that list. But uh, anyway. I'll have to look it up. Thank yeah. you. And that what's yeah. interesting about it is we did we did maintain this where go down is a melee word for warehouse that got into just general Asiatic use. We maintained a supply depot in Hankow for the Yangtze Patrol. It was not attached to the purchasing office in Shanghai, which was a dispersing as well as a purchasing mm -hmm. office. It was attached directly to the Yangtze patrol. And at least by the data I could find, it didn't do a whole lot of business because most everything they sold, the American ships could buy on the open market cheaper in Hankow. But anyway, there is an article 19 years ago or so in the log about those covers. You know, sometimes I think we need to redo occasionally, sort of like a movie being remade. Maybe we just need to pull yeah, some, of the, some of the, the award winners out of mothballs and reprint yeah. them for those of us who don't remember. I don't think I read that at the time. And that sounds... I, I, I think that was before my time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was a member, but I don't know that I remember reading about it. Um, and I would find it, I would find it interesting. I'll have to go look that up if it's... Uh, the website should have some of those. Yes. So I may have to go look at that. You know, trying to get supplies, supplies here was it is a was it always is always I think an issue, particularly food, because there uh, some of their standards left something to be desired. Well, also it was 
you know, it was the back of beyond as far as Washington was concerned. I mean, a yes. couple, when I wrote this article uh, 20, year, 20 years ago, one of the things I learned in looking at the Navy directories for the time was the uh, structuring of how the supply officer for the Yangtze patrol you know, one quarter he's listed as, this was when he was on was flagship, is listed as attached to the flag staff, which would make sense as he was the yeah. officer for the whole Yangtze patrol. But the next quarter he's listed as attached to the ship's complement, not the flag complement. It was like even Washington couldn't quite keep track of that. And when Tutuila was the station ship in Chongqing, Beside, around the time Kemp Tolley was aboard, one of the there was an ensign aboard uh, JG, uh, uh, William J. Letterer, who got, later was much famous for the book The Ugly American. But in one of his books, he did some fictionalizations about his Navy service, and one of them he presents a, a frustrating chain of correspondence with Washington, with the Bureau of Supplies and Accounts in DC, because he's having to buy what we now know as canola oil, but back in the day was known as rapeseed oil. Mm -hmm. Only oil available for, I don't know if this was for lubrication or for cooking or for what, and Washington had clearly had no clue what the stuff was and he's having to justify uh, was, even though there was a supply officer for the uh, patrol, each ship had to have somebody doing the, that duty. So when my father was on Monocacy, the Palos' Pal sister ship, uh, he had about four or five titles, one of which was special dispersing agent to handle the payroll because they only had three line officers and a medical corps officer on board. Mm -hmm. So it was all, you know, it was, it was the end of the line for service in the Navy. You couldn't get farther away from anything than there. Yeah, we kind of looked at it. You were kind of, you, yeah, we were kind of looked at that that way too when we were out there. We were out there. Uh, <laughs> you're in the boonies and don't, they, they sort of remember you. You know, one of the interesting things about that, though, is that there was actually one guy associated with China, Foot, Flag Officer Foot, who was involved in the was it 19, 1830s, 1840s out there, and he got into a shooting match with the Chinese. And actually, he, he came back to the U.S. and he became Grant's right-hand Navy man in the campaign to take Vicksburg. So in those days, yeah, you, you could possibly rise up. The other thing I found, if I did found interesting, is you know we talk about the Yangtze Patrol. This was at the time where we had much better communications. But at the very beginning, with the Asiatic Fleet on China Station, you went out there and you were on your own. And I think they sent you a nice letter. You know, you're being assigned out there. You're supposed to take care of American interests, cooperate with the State Department, be nice to the foreign powers, don't do anything stupid and get us into a shooting war. And whatever happens is, well, you're out there and it's, if you want to ask for advice, it's six months. Well, I, I've always been fond of a quote, which is one of those things that's too good to check in to see if it's really true. But supposedly when John Adams was president, he's supposed to have remarked at one point, you know, we haven't heard from our, our minister to Madrid in quite some time. If we don't hear from him in a year or so, we should write him a letter. You know, <laughs> yeah. Communications was altogether different. Communications was, was radically different. And you, so I think these guys were out there. They were, they had to make it, you had to make a decision. You made a decision. You wrote the report and you kind of hope that, well, I hope the guys back at the home office figured out I made the right decision. And Sometimes they thought so, but I think in general, these guys, these guys were kind of, you were kind of out there on your own. 
Uh, one comment I wanted to make was when you were mentioning rescuing missionaries, one of the things which somewhat comes through in the sand pebbles rather well is the missionaries in taking the interest of the people they were trying to convert were opponents of imperialism. So they often didn't want to be rescued or they wanted yeah. as little to do with the American establishment as they could, except when they needed ultimate protection. But they didn't always cooperate, which made the whole task of looking after them even harder. That's that's true. There was another aspect of that that was brought out, I guess, in what the Dowager Emperor of Sisi, that particularly the foreign men and some of these European missionaries, their converts realized that, hey, you know, if, if the local law or the local Mandarin was going after you for something you did, you ran to the missionary and you told them, hey, you know, they're picking on me. And the missionary would contact his foreign officers who would come up and say, hey, 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 you know, you do, you just leave those boys alone. And this caused a number of problems between the locals and the uh, missionaries and the converts. The, um, there is, you know, when we were out there, one of the other things that was kind of interesting is when you were out there, you look at this city, the area close to the river has got all European architecture. And as you move farther away from the river, you went more of a traditional Chinese architectural style. And we concluded based on absolutely no knowledge other than looking at the buildings that uh, we guessed that the uh, European architecture was in the range of the guns. And once you got beyond the gun range, well, I guess you could on the ship, you could go and have the traditional Chinese architecture. Anything else? Wow. No, very well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot. Read the books. They're well, yeah. worth, they're well worth reading. Thank you for the Jim Chang references. I didn't yes. see those. I'll look at those. Yes. Thank you. She actually, she's got another book out that isn't in here. And it's, what is it? Three th Wild Swans, Three Daughters of China. She, that was the first one she wrote. Her grandmother was a concubine for a warlord. Her mother was in, was a, was uh, supporting her father, who was a communist official. And the daughter was living in London. And it's kind of a family history as it flows through the, the whole era. It, they're good reads. They're good reads. Yeah, your two movies that you referenced, 57 Days in Peking and, and The Sand Pebbles are probably two of my favorites for the China era. Yeah, we, we saw that, that the, the days in Peking, Peking were on, we, that was going when we, we were, they were asking us to go over there. And that was one of the concerns were, were we going to be sitting in the walls as they came rolling over the walls? But when we went over there, we discovered, well, actually, they were pretty friendly. They were, we had something they wanted, money. And as long as you had money, they were happy. I could see that. I don't know what they're, what it's like now. I think now it's, it may be, well, now with the lockdowns, it's, radically different. And as I, I think the, actually, I think the Yangtze is going a lot shallower because of the drought. I don't think you can get up to Chungking anymore in it, or at least until the rains come again. Probably. All right. Well, I'm going to say thank you. And I'm all going right. to log off. I'm going to log off too. Thank you all for listening. You guys all have a great holiday. Yes. And, uh, We'll see you next time. We'll yep. see you next Happy time. Happy holidays. Thanks Happy a lot. Happy holidays. All right. Bye-bye.